Our next case will be McQueer v. Perfect Fence Company. Good morning, Mr. Chief Justice, Justices of the Court, Christian Huffman appearing on behalf of the appellant, Perfect Fence Company. As the Court knows, this case involves a worksite incident. The plaintiff, David McQueer, has conceded that he was an employee of Perfect Fence Company at the time rather than an independent contractor. Sir, can you raise that a little bit? Yes, sir. Thank you. The plaintiff has also conceded that his alleged injuries arose out of and in the course of his employment. Further, he has conceded that the incident which caused his injuries was unforeseen to both him and his supervisor. He said that the post that they were trying to drive in with the bobcat hit an underground soft spot or pocket of water, which neither one of them expected. He has also admitted during his deposition that his supervisor had no specific intent to injure him. It is also undisputed in this case that at the time of the accident, Perfect Fence Company maintained a policy of workers' compensation insurance with the accident fund. The plaintiff has never challenged the existence of that policy. He tried to argue below that although they had the policy, it did not apply to him, but that argument was rejected by both the circuit court and the court of appeals, and the plaintiff has not sought leave to cross-appeal that issue with this court. So at this point, it is established that they had workers' compensation insurance. It is also undisputed by plaintiff's own admission that he has, in fact, received workers' compensation benefits from accident fund. I believe that the circuit court properly recognized that under such undisputed facts, the recovery of workers' compensation benefits is plaintiff's exclusive remedy for his injuries and that the workers' compensation agency has exclusive jurisdiction over his claim. The court of appeals, however, held that plaintiff could proceed in the circuit court with a common law tort action relying on two provisions of the Workers' Compensation Act, the first being the so-called statutory employer provision in section 171 subsection 4 and the intentional tort provision in section 131 subsection 1. I believe that in doing so, the court of appeals misconstrued those provisions and in the process significantly broadened them to the detriment of both the exclusive remedy provision and the exclusive jurisdiction schemes created by the legislature. So can I ask you some questions about the statutory employer provision? Yes, of course. 418.171, right? Yes, Your Honor. It starts out in section 1, if an employer subject to provisions of this act, in this section referred to as a principal. Yes, Your Honor. So every time we hear the word principal in this section, we should understand it to mean employer. Do you agree with that? I believe it means the employer of a contractor. Well, it starts out, if any employer subject to provisions of this act, in this section referred to as the principal. So my question is, in this section when they use the word principal, are we to assume that they're talking about an employer? I believe what they are referring to is a situation where there is a tripartite relationship. It would be, an example I could give would be what would commonly be considered a general contractor. It's a pretty simple question. Yes. When they say, if an employer subject to provisions of this act. Yes, Your Honor. In this section referred to as a principal. Yes. Every time they use the word principal in that section, shall I assume it to mean an employer? Yes, it does mean an employer. Okay. And then any person referred to in this section as a contractor would be the employee, correct? It would be an employee, yes. Okay. So now, how does that play when we get down to section 4? In subsection 4, where it uses the term principals, again. We have to assume it's employers. I agree. It is an employer, but not the employer that they're talking about. With reference to subsection 1 and subsection 3, that, in my opinion, makes clear that they are talking about 
an employer who employs a subcontractor who then employs an employee. Does subsection 3 make subsection 4 inapplicable unless we get to the point of engaging, um, it, unless it falls within the actual provisions of subsection 3? This section shall apply to a principal and contractor only if the contractor engages persons to work other than persons who would not be considered employees under 161. Does yes. that make subsection 4 inapplicable? Yes, Justice Zara. I believe that is defining what the term principal means. It is limiting it to a certain class of employers, as the Justice has defined it. They would have to be employers of a subcontractor. And the subcontractor would then be the employer of the actual injured person. Because that tripartite relationship did not exist here, I believe that subsection 4 is clearly inapplicable based solely on the definition of the first word as made clear by reference to subsections 1 and what subsection What you're referring two. to is the tripartite relationship. It doesn't yeah. come into play until section 3? Excuse me? The tripartite relationship that you're describing, which I think I understand. Yes. It doesn't come into play in this, in this provision until subsection 3. No. It comes into play in, in section, subsection 1, where it says, if an employer subject to the provisions of this act, in this section referred to as the principal, so as I agree with the justice, the principal is a, a type of employer. Contracts with any it's other not person. A type. It says any employer. Yes. But go on. All right, go ahead. Okay. Contracts with any other person in this section referred to as the contractor. So when it says in this section referred to as the principal, it is saying the principal is an employer, but a certain type of employer, the employer of a contractor. It then goes on to say that the contractor is the person who employs the actual injured worker. So there is a tripartite relationship. So it would have to be a situation where a... Uh, I guess I'm having a hard time because it says when the employer contracts with any other person. It doesn't say a contractor. It says the employer contracts with any other person. And then it goes on to say in this section will be referred to as a contractor. Yes. So where do we get the tripartite relationship in subsection 1? You have the employer referred to as the principal who contracts with any other person who is the contractor. And then what, who is the I contractor? think what you're saying you is that the employer subject to the provisions of this act is defined in section 3. Yes. It is a, the principal is an employer who employs a contractor who then engages persons to work other than persons who would be, not be considered employees under section 161.1d. It's kind of inartfully phrased, but as I interpret what this is saying is you have an employer called the principal who retains an uninsured subcontractor, what they call a contractor. That sub uninsured subcontractor retains someone to do the work who is considered the employee. The employee gets injured because the subcontractor does not have workers' compensation insurance. The employee can go against the principal. The principal is so, deemed so, his employer. All right, so it's not the most artfully drafted statute, but looking at subsection 3, that, which yeah. I think creates this relationship you, you're describing, this section shall, this section, uh, this section, uh, this provision, shall apply to a principal, an employer, yes. and contractor, which we understand above to mean any other person. So this section shall apply to an employer and any other person, only if that person, again a contractor, yes. engages persons to work other than persons who would not be considered employees under 161. Yes. That's what creates this relationship. Yes. Okay, so if I accept that, then we don't get the subsection 4 in this case. Is that your? Yes, that is, that is my argument. Okay. The, this statutory provision 171 is meant to encompass circumstances where what they call a principal, what would normally be uh, phrased as a general contractor, retains a subcontractor who does not have workers' compensation insurance. The subcontractors 
employee gets injured because there is no contract, no, no policy for him to recover under, he is allowed to maintain a claim directly against the principal. The principal is deemed to be his employer. So because of that, I do not believe that that uh, section 171 subsection 4 applies. Also, the plaintiff in this case argued that Perfect Fence had used deceit, coercion, or intimidation to get him to claim that he was an independent contractor, but they claimed that, he did, that Perfect Fence did that for a specific purpose. Now, even if the court accepts as true that Perfect Fence did that, the purpose that they allege is not one of the two limited purposes for which the legislature has said that a principal can be sued. The plaintiff argued they did it for the purpose of preventing him to keep him from making a claim for workers' compensation benefits. And your response is that you had some workers' compensation, not necessarily valid compensation or even sufficient compensation, but that the fact they had some compensation was enough to exculpate you under that language. Yes, there's been no indication that the coverage that they had, the policy that they had, was insufficient. What is happening here is when you have a situation where the, the legislature says the purpose of the deceit has well, how to be... Could it not, how, how could it not have been insufficient given that you failed to inform the insurer that plaintiff was your employee and presumably the insurance uh, provider was not aware of that at the time? As so long as the policy is in place. Some policy. Yes. Plaintiff, any, po any policy. Plaintiff is deemed to be an insured or at least an intended third party beneficiary. He can make a claim directly with accident fund. So, so long as the policy is there, he can make a claim for insurance. What subsection four is talking about. Council, I, good morning. I, I just yeah. have a, a question. And a, a lot of this just goes to kind of just the overall kind of justice of this. And I, I want you to kind of walk through with me for a second because this is troubling. And I, I think this is something we can't just totally gloss over totally easily. I mean, let's, if we were to look at the allegations that are kind of put forth in the complaint, you know, let's look at kind of what ultimately happened here. You had a situation where, for all intents and purposes, you know, you, you had a pretty dangerous situation that was taking place. Your, your foreman was aware of the, you know, was aware of the ultimate danger, you know, as it pertains to this circumstance, and you have a pretty catastrophic injury that, that arose out of it. You then have your defendant go to the plaintiff's house and basically say to them, you know, oh, you, you shouldn't, you know, you know, to try to trick them to say that they shouldn't be filing for workers' compensation because workers' compensation isn't available. So I just, I can't totally let you kind of walk by this and gloss over it because I'd like you to respond to the fact that, you know, you, you have a situation where basically, you, you know, your entity basically ultimately indicated to the plaintiff that he would not be eligible for workers' compensation, he didn't work for them, he didn't qualify for it, so he shouldn't be filing any complaint. He went to his house to do it. So I guess the, the question I would have here is, is that, how can you imagine a situation where you're able to have it both ways, where ultimately you're able to go and basically lie to the plaintiff, lie to a horribly injured person, tell them that they're not going to be qualified, tell them they can't get this compensation, tell them this is a benefit they're not going to be available to, and now come back and say, oh, well, this is the only thing that they're able to have is workers' compensation. It seems to me like if this court were to go in that direction, that would really set a really problematic precedent because ultimately an employer could go forth, lie to the person, try to get them to not file for workers' compensation, and if the worst thing that happens to that person, the only risk that you assume is that they get their workers' compensation. How do you get to have both ways? I, I guess I'm misunderstanding the justice's question. Is the justice... The question is if you, if you tell someone that they're not going to be eligible for workers' compensation, if you tell them that, they're, that it's not going to be available to them, and if you tell them that it's not, they're not going to qualify for it, how is it that you can come back now and say that this is the only remedy that they are going to be able to have? Because the remedy that the justice is getting at is not in the statute. I understand all the facts the, that the justice is arguing, but it seems to me that what you're asserting, Justice Bernstein, 
is that the court should be able to legislate into the act something that the Michigan legislature did not put in there. So your premise would be that the legislature kind of intended for this to happen, that the legislature would intend for a large company, um, I mean, I understand this isn't a, as, as large as like General Motors or Ford, but that they should basically be able to go and lie to somebody, tell them they, that they're not going to be eligible for workers' compensation, and then what if that person misses the deadline? They, they're not, they don't file within that deadline, then they're ultimately eligible for nothing. They can't do a third party claim. They can't do a workers' compensation claim. I mean, is it your, is it your presumption that that's what the legislature intended was for large scale corporations or conglomerates to be able to um, basically go forth, take advantage of individual plaintiffs who've been catastrophically injured in the hopes that they wouldn't file for workers' compensation? And then if they don't file for workers' compensation, they're left with absolutely no remedy whatsoever? Your Honor, my time has expired. May but I you can answer. No, no. The great thing about this job is you're more okay. than able to answer. We, we have lots of time, so I'd love to okay. hear the answer. My response to Your Honor would be that under the doctrine of expressio unius, the legislature has put in two circumstances. They've, they've thought of two situations, specified two situations, where deceit or coercion will enable the plaintiff to make a claim directly against the employer. Those are when it is for the purpose of evading Section 171 or for the purpose of evading the requirements of Section 611, which require them to maintain a policy of insurance. Because they have specified two situations where deceit will enable him to make a claim, it must be presumed that they intended for the situation Your Honor is talking about to not qualify as an exception. Any further questions? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Counsel. Let's hear from the other side. Good morning. Mark Bronzato on behalf of the plaintiff appellee. I feel short. I feel a little bit taller. Uh, I waive any self-imposed limitation on the asking of questions by the court. Um, this is a case, uh, my opponent has cited a number of facts which we do in fact concede, including the fact that my client was in fact the employee of Perfect Fence. Uh, my opponent has overlooked one essential fact uh, that's important to this case, and that is that the defendant was engaged in a scheme to defraud his insurance company, its insurance company, um, and that scheme involved um, not uh, reporting my client to the insurance company, uh, trying to get uh, uh, a uh, better deal on their insurance. Uh, it also, that scheme also involved uh, um, defrauding presumably the federal government and the state government by treating my client solely as an independent contractor, um, uh, despite the fact that he worked full time for the defendants. Um, he was kept off the books, they said, for financial reasons. The fact is this case, um, um, uh, the key point in this case is that there was this uh, uh, effort to defraud. Um, and the reason that becomes important is obviously 671 paren 4, uh, uh, the provision of the compact that the Court of Appeals used in this case to deny or to reverse the summary disposition that was granted. And uh, as I read 671.4, there are four elements, basically, that would have to exist to have a cause of action um, or to uh, exclude this case from the exclusive remedy provision of the Workers' Compensation Act. And all four of them exist in this case. Uh, and that is there was a willful or uh, a willing act uh, to circumvent uh, one of the two acts that is, in fact, identified in uh, six, uh, 171 paren 4, um, that statute refers not just to the statutory employer section that it's in, it also refers, obviously, to 611, which is the uh, obtaining of insurance. And um, what's important about this case is, despite the ruling that the Court of Appeals made on whether there was a direct violation of 611, a ruling which um, uh, is not before this court at this time. The fact is that 171.4 does not require a direct violation of, uh, of uh, 611. 
It only requires, as the Michigan Court of Appeals has uh, ruled in the McFall case, it only requires an attempt. And that's precisely what the defendant in this case happened to be engaged in. He was engaged in an attempt to circumvent 611. Um, the, the other requirement uh, that under 171.4 is that the defendant has to use coercion, um, intimidation, or deceit. A uh, little question about the existence of that element being satisfied here in light of the way that they treated uh, Mr. McQueer in, in their books and records and in light of the way they treated their insurance company when the insurance company did an audit to try to determine who was in fact covered because as the court presumably knows, the audit, which coincidentally was done one day after Mr. McQueer's accident, that audit, um, when they turned over their books and records to reveal the number of employees that they had, which would, of course, determine the premium that they would pay, uh, did not include Mr. McQueer's name, uh, part of the fraud that was going on here. Um, and, and the other requirement under 171.4, another requirement, is that they must um, encourage employees to pose as contractors. Um, in this case, they were, in fact, asking Mr. McQueer to act as an independent contractor uh, for the company. The company made that clear. Um, in, Can you in, help me work through subsection 3? Subsection yeah. 171.3. Can you help me work through that? I was trying to do that with, a, with your yes. opposing counsel. So it says this section, and I believe this section then would be 171. You agree? No, I do not agree. I do not agree. Why? Because what what the what what three is is an exception to the statutory employer. That's what it, it is an exception to. Section four is a penalty provision. So it is a say, penalty provision. Okay. When they say this section. Yes, I know what, it says this section. What section are they referring to? They're referring to 171, in my estimation, 171.1. And that is the statutory employer. Because the legislature, in my estimation, reading this commonsensically, is not, by doing what they did in subsection 3, it is not attempting to undermine the penalty that was being imposed on employers. You are correct. It does cover employers. Employers who are intentionally trying to circumvent this section. That's what 4 is about. Employers intentionally trying to circumvent this section. Now, it seems to me that the legislature would not be uh, in the mood, despite the fact the way they wrote subsection 3, the legislature does not intend to undermine the very penalty that they are in fact imposing on anybody who's doing anything to try to circumvent this particular statute. So when they That's, say this section, they really meant to say <coughs> subsection It one. means the statutory employer. Which is subsection one. That's, that's what the statutory employer is. Okay. That's correct. The, be, why would the legislature pass a prov provision which says no employer can ever, ever try, even try, because remember this really is about attempts, no employer could ever even try to circumvent this statute. Now, there, it seems to me that they wouldn't qualify that by the by three, which is obviously a limitation on where to where they will extend the concept of statutory employer. That is how I would commonsensically read subsection three. And the, the final uh, element of 171.4. It is, is a motivation issue, and that is that the employer has to take these steps, to take these steps to uh, circumvent either 171 or 611 for the purposes of evading either 171 or 611. Now, this, this, case, this case is um, uh, limited. Let, us, let me put it that way. Limited in terms of the evidence that actually exists with respect to the, to the uh, motivation for all of these things. The defendants have suggested that they engaged in this fraud just to keep their premiums down. Okay, that's why they did this fraud. And somehow 
that, that does not implicate this last requirement of 171.4. But the, the fact is that the defendants in their own conduct in the case, defendants' agents, I should say, in their own conduct in this case, indicated that, that they were doing what they were doing to defraud both the government and their insurance company for the purposes of avoiding 611. They, that, that's precisely what happened when Mr. McQueer got injured. He's taken to the hospital. He, his uh, supervisor calls the owner of the company and relays the message, don't tell anybody at the hospital that um, uh, you were working today for perfect fence because you're not covered in comp. Um, in other words, th they took the position at the time that what they did, what they were doing to defraud their insurance company was in fact for a particular purpose, and that was to avoid the obligations that they have under 611. The same thing is true of what happened shortly after the accident. Uh, Mr. Crum, the owner of the company, came with the company's bookkeeper to his house and asked him to sign some papers, um, ma retroactively making him an employee of the company. The, uh, Mr. McQueer obviously refused to sign them, but they informed him at that time that they were, couldn't put his, um, 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 his claim through comp because he wasn't covered. The, the actions of the defendant in this case point to one bit of motivation. Their entire motivation for, for defrauding their insurance company was designed to avoid their uh, duties, their, the requirements of 611, regardless of what the Court of Appeals has ruled with respect to an actual violation of 611, which, by the way, I think is about the, the only interesting legal issue in this case, what the Court of Appeals ruled there, because what we have in this case is a potential uh, situation in which there may not have been coverage. Um, and because of the unanswered questions that exist in this case with respect to why these benefits were being paid, uh, the fact is that benefits were not paid in this case until one week after this case was filed. Um, they, were, they, were, they came unbidden, so to speak. Um, they just came. And the question is why? And the plaintiff's lawyer attempted to get to the bottom of that question in this case. He was unsuccessful because he was prevented from uh, deposing um, two uh, agents of, of the accident fund company, the company that insured this case. Um, Accident Fund did, in fact, pay benefits in this case after the case was filed. But by way of an affidavit in this case signed by the plaintiff's attorney, the plaintiff's attorney confirmed through the Accident Fund that the reason they were paid were, was not because of the provisions of the policy that pertain to workers' compensation coverage. They were paid because of another section, according to these agents of the company, by another, under another section of the policy. Now that raises the question, I think, whether there was, in fact, coverage uh, that complied with 611. But confining myself to 171.4, which was what the Court of Appeals decided in this case. There are numerous factual questions that exist on whether, in fact, all of the elements of this uh, particular uh, claim do have been made under, under the requirements of 171.4 because we clearly are in a case in which there was a, a, an attempt to defraud an insurance company. The question, perhaps the un un unaddressed question that it must be resolved, is why did they do what they did? But their actions in this case, what they told Mr. McQueer at the time of the accident, speak to the fact that they had a particular motivation for doing so. And that motivation was, in fact, one of the things that specifically identified in 171.4, which was, of course, to circumvent the provision of the compact, it's the 611, that requires insurance. I don't know if you want me to speak briefly to the um, uh, amendment issue, but the, the, um, the amendment question in this case is not something that should uh, involve this court or detain this court. The amendment, uh, first of all, as uh, the fight case found um, many years ago, um, when, when a court looks at um, the question of futility in amendments, 
um, the court is not supposed to examine the substantive merits of the claim. And that's a pretty important point when you think about it, because the substantive merits of the claim get litigated in a C-10 motion. And, and the fact is that the court normally, it would seem to me, uh, would not have all of the information it would require to decide a C-10 motion purely on a motion to amend. Uh, and as in most other cases in which uh, motions to amend their file, um, discovery is often not completed. The same was true here. There was no, uh, there was no uh, discovery cutoff date that had been passed. So we have a situation where the plaintiff had additional time to do discovery. The only thing before the court was, in fact, a motion to, to amend, and the, and the court, the circuit court, transformed that motion to amend into a C-10 motion, uh, completely inappropriate, and the Court of Appeals, I think, dealt with that issue uh, uh, correctly in deciding that that was a mistake, and it certainly was a mistake under this court's uh, decision in Ben Fike. Any further questions? Any further questions? Okay, thank you very much. The case will be submitted.